Our next speaker is speaking on the humanity of Christ. Is he truly human? Brother Danny Douglas is a faithful gospel preacher, a good friend to not only myself, but to many here, if not all. Some of us have known him longer than others, but we all know him as a dedicated person to the cause of Christ. He's a native of Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. He's been preaching the gospel since regularly since 1977. He served churches of Christ in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, in Gallipolis, Gallipolis, Ohio, Lawrenceburg, Mount Pleasant, Columbia, Ardmore, and Dresden, Tennessee, and Floyd, Chesapeake, and Portsmouth, Virginia. He's done full-time mission work in the Ukraine and the United Kingdom. And it was in the United Kingdom now quite a while ago that we ran across Danny and have considered that a, a good meeting. I hope he has, and we love him dearly. He has worked in public education for a long time, served as a teacher, a principal, served as a college instructor. And he's preached over the radio, and uh, he is the editor of a paper, Standing Fast, and he's one of the teachers in Truth Bible Institute. He and his faithful wife, Laarney Tabalon Douglas, are blessed with two children, Lydia and Daniel Moses. And we're glad to have men like him who are honest, and decent, and good men who love the truth and contend for the faith. And we're more than happy to do all we can to support him, his life, and work. And now come speak to us, Brother Danny, on the humanity of Jesus. Is he truly human? <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Brown. It's indeed a privilege to be back in spring again. Thank you for the privilege to be one of the speakers for these other great and godly people. Appreciate the faithful elders here and Brother Brown, a faithful and sound preacher of the gospel. And thank you for the Lord's Church at spring and all that she stands for and does in the brotherhood and in the kingdom. I'd also like to <clears throat> say thank you to the ladies for all these good meals and for those who provide transportation to and from the airport. <clears throat> I'm glad we don't feel like the preacher one time that uh, he preached in the congregation one Sunday morning. The family invited him to come home with them and they were sitting at the dinner table and Little Johnny said, Dad, would you please pass the old goat? And the mother said, Son, you know we don't eat goat at this house. And he said, Well, this morning before Sunday school, I heard you say, Let's go ahead and have the old goat this Sunday and get it over with. <laughs> so I believe we can all say this week that we don't feel like we've been treated like an old goat. We appreciate everything. Tonight we have a great subject, the humanity of Christ. Did Christ become truly human? And what did this involve? And is he truly human now? And what does that mean to us? Jesus Christ is referred to as the Son of Man. This was the designation that he used to indicate his humanity. For the Son of Man, he said, has come to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19 and 10. Our Lord used that expression of himself in over 80 instances in the New Testament as the Son of Man. The appellation for his divinity is the expression of the Son of God. 1 Timothy 3.16 said that God was manifest in the flesh. Christ is mentioned as one of the Godhead three in Matthew 28, 19 of the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The one who is to be born of the Virgin Mary, Jesus, because he is our Savior, will be Emmanuel, which means God with us in the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy of Isaiah 7.14. 
And we read of this in Matthew 1, 21 to 23. He was miraculously conceived in the virgin, as the angel of the Lord said to Joseph, For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 1 and verse 20. <clears throat> the one who was in the beginning with God made all things, and without him was not anything made that was made. And later in John 1, the scripture said, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, verse 14. But the becoming of flesh on the part of the Word, the second person of the Godhead, was not merely a matter of him taking on a physical body and then exempting himself from other aspects of humanity, temptations, trials, and sufferings. We can prove that the physical body is not the full extent of humanity anyway. For example, in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, Paul said that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But yet in Revelation 21, 3, we read of the tabernacle of God being with men. That is, men in heaven. They will still be men but they will not have the flesh and blood body anymore. In Hebrews 2 and verse 16, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. In all things, Milligan says in his commentary, that means all things essential to perfect humanity. And thus Jesus submitted himself to all things that pertain to earthly existence. And he underwent the things that man undergoes. All things with the exception of this. He never sinned, no, not one time. And you know this, that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. 1 John 3 verse 5. And he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4, 15. He is undefiled and holy and separate from sinners. Hebrews 7, verse 26. He knew no sin. And in contrast with all of us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. But now let's look at the fact that Christ did undergo the things that we do. We note that he hungered and thirsted, Matthew 4 and 2. I thirst, he said, on the cross, John 19, 28. During the storm on the water, he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep. He must have been so tired that even the storm couldn't wake him. In Mark 4, verse 38. He went through the loss of loved ones. We remember the passing of his good friend and follower Lazarus. The Bible said Jesus wept. And the Jews said, Behold, how he loved him. Verse 36. He also knew what it was like to have to say goodbye to loved ones. I'm sure that is what some of us are dreading. We know that we have prepared for heaven, and we are looking forward to that home. But it is going to be sad to think that we're going to have to leave loved ones behind. We are hurting for them. In John 14, a great chapter of comfort that we read in times of sorrow, 
Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This was said following at the end of John 13, the news to his disciples, when he said to them, that where I am going, you cannot follow me now. The sad news that he broke to them, that he was going to have to leave them behind. And then, of course, that very touching scene at the cross, when there stood by his mother and the other women and the disciple whom he loved, and he committed the care of his mother to the disciple whom he loved, he said, Woman, behold thy son, and then to John, behold thy mother. John 19, 25, 27. We read, moreover, in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before his crucifixion, that he was in an agony and praying earnestly, and he sweat as it were great drops of blood down to the ground. Luke 22, 44. Medical experts tell us that in times of extreme emotional agony, the pores of the skin can open up and the blood seep through. Oh yes, the Lord is touched with our grief. The man of sorrows that we've just sung about. Psalm 22 says, all my bones are out of joint. That's prophecy of the crucifixion. After all, in order to inhale, he had to push up on the nails. And to exhale, he had to let back down and rest his weight on them. And all the writhing and twisting and anguish and pain that he went through, we can see why all of his bones were out of joint. That psalm also says, they pierced my hands and my feet. And he said, I tell all my bones. That's the old English word for count. How could the Lord count every bone in his body? It's because every bone ached in pain upon the cross. Jesus Christ knew what it was like to live a life of lowliness, poverty, hardship, deprivation, and lowly circumstances. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. And he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Isaiah 53 and 2. He said in Matthew 8, 20 and Luke 9, 58, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. On that night before his terrible death, he said, Mine own familiar friend hath lifted up his heel against me. There in John 13, verse 18. This was a fulfillment of Psalm 41, verse 9. Maybe some people think, well, the Lord was never married. He doesn't know what it was like to be deserted by one's husband or wife. Or he doesn't know what it was like for one's marital mate to adulterate the marriage. Oh, but no, my friends. The Lord knows. He was betrayed. He knew betrayal. Remember that. Moreover, Jesus Christ knew physical labor. He was called the carpenter, Mark 6, verse 3. Furthermore, Christ Jesus experienced the temptation to sin. We may feel all oh, with the Lord. He just could snap his fingers and overcome temptation. 
there was no real temptation to him. But that's not the case. We read in Matthew 4 and Luke chapter 4, and also Mark 1, 12 and 13, how that our Lord was tempted. And each time he used what we need to use to overcome temptation, the Word of God. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. We read how that the devil departed from him, and Luke said, for a season, Luke 4, 13. Yes, friends, if we resist the devil, he will flee from us, James 4, 7. But do not think that he's going to leave us alone permanently. We have solid reason to believe that the devil hurled other temptations at Jesus. But our Lord was not a worldly individual. Neither should we be. That which is of the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's not of the Father, that's of the world. 1 John 2, 16. And haven't we been, this week been talking about things that are of the world with all these ungodly philosophies and immorality and humanism and all the fornication, adultery, and homosexuality that we've been discussing and these evil philosophies to downgrade the Bible and to put down the creation and the existence of God these things, my beloved, are of the world. They are not of the Father. We can sum it up like that. And John said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2.15 Jesus Christ had the love of the Father perfectly in him. He did not love the world. And we are to be like King Jesus Christ. But now is Christ Jesus perfectly human now? Let's think about that question. Remember that he is referred to as the Son of Man. He was human. And the Son of God. A very unusual passage is in John chapter 6 beginning at verse 53. This refers to eating the flesh and the blood of our Lord. The early church were falsely accused of being cannibals, according to Roman history. But I do not believe this passage is talking about the Lord's Supper either. It certainly is not talking about cannibalism. But this, in pa this passage includes everything that the Lord taught, including the Lord's Supper. But this is a strong symbolism, so strong that after this, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with it. This strong symbolism teaches us that we are to be a part of Christ, that we are to abide in him, we are to love him, and to keep his word. Here Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. The Son of Man became flesh and blood, human. Here he is called the Son of Man. He was human. But in the next verse, he declares to be able to do something, to make a promise that only a divine personage to make when he said, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Only God could do that. Thus, Jesus Christ was man and God. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Paul wrote this after the beginning of the church, after the announcement of Peter 
therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he had shed forth this which you now see and hear. This was after the coronation of Christ, after he had sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, Hebrews 1 and 3. After he had fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah 6, 12, and 13 as the builder of the Lord's house, as a priest on his own throne, after Jesus Christ took that throne and became our great high priest and built the church, at this point, Paul says in present tense, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He's the man Christ Jesus right now, as well as God. Brother J.W. Shepherd of the Gospel Advocate Commentaries makes this statement. The statement that there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, himself, man, Christ Jesus, is in the present tense when Paul wrote, he was still a man. He did not leave his godhood above when he came down to earth and became a man, so he did not leave his manhood on earth when he ascended to heaven. In heaven today, the man Christ Jesus officiates as mediator on our behalf. Realizing this, let us rejoice and give renewed diligence to make our calling and election sure. Now, Brother Ken Chumley spoke this afternoon. Brother Ken, a good brother and friend and Englishman. Over in Liverpool, England, many years ago, there was the old sailor's house. It caught on fire, I believe, one night. And those at the lower level were able to escape. They extended the ladder, and others who were higher above, they escaped. But yet those at the top were still trapped because the ladder was not long enough. So they put a man on the top rung of the ladder, and he stretched himself out. And those men who were in the flames above climbed down over that man onto the ladder to their escape. It took the length of a man to save their lives. In like manner, it took the length of a man to save mankind. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As our mediator and high priest, our heavenly advocate on the right hand of God, the man Christ Jesus represents man to God, just as when he came to earth he represented God to man. And John said, My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Scripture teaches the necessity that Christ had to come to this earth in the form of a man, to save us from sin. But God had to come in the flesh. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made, upon, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. And after that we read of God the Father exalting the Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is greater than Charles Darwin, who is greater than Barack Obama, who is greater than any worldly philosophy or any human being. He is the King of kings. And Lord of Lords, the blessed and only potentate, First Timothy 6.15. Jesus Christ would be man at his second coming. We note in Matthew, the 26th chapter before the Sanhedrin, and the unfair trial that they were giving him, and they were, of course, just looking to condemn him, Shortly thereafter, he would be put to death. 
But in Matthew 26, 63 and 64, But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tellest whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. You know that's also repeated in the book of Mark 14, verses 61 and 62. And you know the right hand of power means the right hand of God. Luke indicates that to us in this parallel that he gave in Luke 22, verse 69, that the man Christ Jesus, on the right hand of God being divine, he will come in the clouds of heaven. He will one day judge this Sanhedrin who treated him so unjustly and unfairly. And I'll tell you something else. He's going to judge all these other ungodly individuals today who are condemning him and his word and who are holding up this degradation and filth and immorality and evil philosophy before the eyes of man, even in our country. It matters not who it is. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, Romans 14 and 10, this is what we need to tell people. We don't need to cow down to these intimidating people in our country today. We need to point them to Jesus Christ as Savior, but we also need to inform them that he will one day be your judge. He will be your judge, the man Christ Jesus, the divine one. In Paul's speech in the synagogue at Antioch, Pisidia, in Acts 13, in verse 37 to 39, he said, But he whom God raised again knew no corruption, or saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. Through this man, Jesus Christ, yes, indeed, he is human now. But last of all this evening, for what purpose did Jesus Christ become truly human? We now turn to the book of Hebrews, the second chapter, in verse number 9 and 10. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. That's the inspired writer's way here of describing humanity, a little lower than the angels. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. We notice for one thing here that Jesus Christ was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Is that not the glad and joyful tidings, the good news of the gospel, that he, by the grace of God, tasted death for every man. Now you talk about something that can bring a sense of love and unity back to people. That's the, what the message our nation needs today, the message of the gospel of Christ. That no matter who we are, what race or color or nationality, or social status, or financial class, or educational level, that Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, tasted death for every man. Does that not make every person important and precious to the Lord? 
But moreover, we know that he became man to bring many sons unto glory. Hebrews 2 and verse 10. He did this that by his death he might destroy the devil and deliver man. Look at verses 14 and 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death for all their lifetime subject to bondage. In his death, Christ disarmed Satan. He did this by his perfect sacrifice in the shedding of his blood. Take our sins away. In Revelation 1, 5, it's a beautiful statement or expression. Here Jesus Christ is described as him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. But you see, dear friends, he had to become human in order for that to take place in order to shed his blood for us, to offer his body a perfect sacrifice upon the cross. In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 19 and 20, before we read that, you remember in the Matthew 27, around about verse 51, when Jesus died, what happened in the temple? The veil separating the holy place from the most holy place was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. This represented to man that because of Christ's sacrifice, there would be no more separation. Man would be able to go into the presence of God, which would have been absolutely impossible had Christ not offered himself on the cross. Now bear this in mind as we read Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 19. After saying earlier in the chapter concerning God, he said, A body hast thou prepared me, beginning at verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness, that is, confidence, to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Remember the holiest. The most holy place represented the presence of God. By a new living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We know that Jesus Christ did that for us, which we could not do for ourselves. Now let's look at the end of Hebrews 2, beginning at verse 16. <clears throat> for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like and to his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, that is to help and to aid them that are tempted. We know that Jesus Christ took on the flesh, not only to offer himself on the cross, but to become perfect through his sufferings. Now, if you stop and think about what he said back there in Hebrews uh, chapter 2 and verse 10, the captain of their salvation being made perfect through sufferings is what he's teaching. And also in uh, Hebrews 5, 8 and 9, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience 
by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. In what sense was our captain and high priest, Jesus Christ, made perfect? Well, it was not here meant in the sinless sense. He was already perfect. He was already undefiled and sinless. So what is the idea here of being made perfect? The idea here is perfect, complete, full, lacking nothing, that he might be the perfect Savior and high priest of mankind. I'd like to read a story related by the late Brother G.C. Brewer. He said, back in the 13th century, when King Edward of England made Wales a principality of Great Britain, having suppressed the independence of the Welsh people, the people of that little country were disappointed and dissatisfied. They felt that they would not receive proper consideration from the government, that they would not be properly represented at the throne. In order to placate these people, King Edward had his wife, Queen Eleanor, who was expecting an heir, to leave the palace and the throne of England and to journey down into Wales that the prince might be born there. Accordingly, Prince Edward was born in the newly built castle of Carnarvon and presented by his royal father to the Welsh people <clears throat> as the Prince of Wales. Then these people could rejoice in the fact that the heir to the throne and later the king on the throne was a native of their country, hence one of their citizens and brethren. Just so, in order to placate and reconcile men of earth, God caused his son to leave heaven, the throne of light, unapproachable, to journey down into the earth and to be born of a woman, born under the law, and then presented him to the people of earth as a prince and a savior. And now we can rejoice in the overwhelming thought that the king on the throne of the universe is a native of earth, one of our citizens and our brethren, himself, man, Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. In conclusion this evening, in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore, that is for this reason, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus Christ is in touch with the feeling of our infirmities. This word here, being touched with the feeling of our infirmities, the verb sympathiel means A, to be affected with the same feelings, feeling as another, to sympathize with, or and or be in reference to the wretched, to feel for have compassion on Hebrews 4.15, end of quote, by Thayer. As we close this evening, what a blessing that the fully divine Christ became truly human and retains that humanity in common with us today. And thus we have a heavenly advocate and mediator and high priest on the right hand of God in our behalf.
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Danny. I don't know how people can hear that and not be humble. We'll stand dismissed.